All righty, I think we can go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Tanya Papa and I am the manager of cities and youth engagement here at the Children and Nature Network. I'm glad to be with you all today and thank you for supporting our work. I'd like to welcome you all to our very first Inside Out uh, Youth Leadership Development Series. By participating in this series, you'll join a diverse and welcoming network of leaders who are eager to help youth reach their full potential as people and as nature advocates. Today, our workshop will be on youth councils, and we will hear from leaders in the space, um, in this space, and have the opportunity to imagine what a youth council could look like at your organization or in your community. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, the closed caption enable is, the closed captioning is enabled. The chat is enabled for all attendees, so feel free to comment in there. And also this event is being recorded and we will share this out within a week or so. So today I am joining you from the land of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute people. We invite you to share where you're calling in from today. If you are not familiar with the history of your location, you can learn about indigenous territories and the land that you are on with a native land map. And we dropped a link in the chat. And while folks are doing that, um, I'd also like to share ways that we can go beyond the practice of land acknowledgements. We can educate ourselves on indigenous history and current movements. We can advocate for land back and learn from their ways of land stewardship. We can follow indigenous social media accounts to reshare and amplify indigenous voices year round. And we can support indigenous science, businesses, uh, reconnection and their causes. Awesome, it's great to see so many folks from all over, all over the US. We've got folks in Costa Rica. Awesome. Um, it's pretty awesome to be in this space and to see how many movers and shakers are here today with us. Um, as you might know, Youth Advisory Councils are a youth engagement strategy used by programs and organizations to positively incorporate youth voices and help build the capacity of young leaders. In today's panel, we have Ashley Chabelli Pettis and Kirsten Johansson from the city of Austin. We have Diane Lill from Conservation Nation. And last but not least, we have Tyler Messias from Earth Guardians. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here with us today. We are excited to learn from and alongside you. To get us started, I'd like to invite each of you to introduce yourself and provide some of your experience with youth advisory councils and any impacts that you have seen they've had. Um, we can go ahead and start with alphabetical order. So we'll have Ashley kick us off. <laughs> Hey y'all, thank you Tanya for that introduction. Um, it's wonderful to see everyone today, um, really big group. So I'm Ashley Chabelli Pettis. I work for the city of Austin in the development services department, urban forestry program. Um, I am a conservation program coordinator, but focusing on urban forest youth education. Um, I wear a few different hats in my job. So. I have that, and then I'm also a Children in Nature Network Austin Collaborative Chair, along with two others. And I also sit as a chair on our Youth Leadership Working Group um, with Kirsten, um, with Cities Connecting Children to Nature. So yeah, just sitting on a lot of different, in a lot of different rooms and a lot of different tables. Um, but always, you know, priority is youth voice, right? And bringing in youth voice into these um, adult, a prominent adult spaces, essentially. Um, but yeah, so along my journey, I've worked 
in a, a few different capacities. I'm originally from New York City, so inner city kid growing up in the Bronx, New York, never really under, never really, you know, getting into nature, um, even though it was all around me. Eventually, I, I found that out um, in my older years. Um, but when I did figure it out, um, started to look for work in the outdoors. And like my first job in the outdoors with a, was with a nonprofit in the Bronx. And it was just like as a team leader to a group of teens and bringing them outside and essentially explaining like the workings of trees and why they're benefit to New York City and, and the community. Um, and doing that work really invigorated like a passion of in me, you know, and looking and bringing these experience to these young folks in the city, um, similar to my experience of growing up, never really seeing the trees until they were introduced to me. Um, and when I did that work, it just really invigorated a passion in me to continue on um, bringing, bringing this new view of the environmental world to the young folks. Um, so working in New York, going to Dallas, and now in uh, the city of Austin and bringing the, those viewpoints a few impacts I've seen from having um, or being a part of the Youth Leadership Working Group, which is what we have as our Youth Advisory Council. Um, I also support our internship, our Youth Forest Council internship. Um, but a few things that I have seen um, in these in these in these groups is just um, learning how to share a dynamic of power in these spaces with our, with our youth leaders and making sure they have the space and opportunity to share their voice and their opinions and their thoughts because they're all very valued and showing how we value their thoughts and, and their viewpoints um, and their ideas. Uh, for example, in, this, in our Youth Forest Council, we give our interns an opportunity to sit um, on a larger board of grant reviews for our urban forestry grant. And this is, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars coming through the city to provide um, urban forestry benefits, education, plantings to the city of Austin. And to be a young person sitting on, on, on a board, you know, uh, reading these proposals, um, we're asking their advice, asking, you know, it, uh, you know, is it beneficial? You know, what do you see the outcome of, of all these grants? Um, and giving them the tools and resources to be that voice in the room has just been just a wonderful experience. Um, and an experience that they wouldn't have had if we didn't give them that, that opportunity, right? So sitting sitting back and seeing the amazing thoughts and contributions of these young folks in these like large scale programs um, have been have been like mind blowing and changing and and also for the interns um, feeling that role that responsibility or being able to have a voice in these large scale ideas and these programs and these projects, um, I feel heightens them and, and gives them um, a sense of passion and, it's, and a sense of importance. Um, so thinking about the impacts um, of a youth ad advisory council, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, and I won't talk forever, I'm sure we'll go on and I'll hand it over to the next person. Thank you, Ashley. The passion is oozing already in this space, so I'm excited to hear um, from you. And I'm going to pass the mic over to Diane to share a little bit about yourself and um, the impacts that you've seen from Youth Advisory Councils for those just joining us. Thank you um, so much for including me in this panel. I have been an environmental educator for uh, about 25 years. And I have worked with students of all ages, but I think the age group that we're talking about today is definitely a sweet spot for me. Uh, and my organization now, Conservation Nation, is probably one you've all never heard of because it's very, very young, um, was founded in September of 2021. 
And so from the very beginning, we had a youth advisory council to provide that youth voice in what has essentially been like the very roots of a startup organization, which is really exciting. And I was very, very fortunate when I joined Conservation Nation in September 22, which was right before the one year anniversary, that I inherited this wonderful youth advisory council. Half of them were returning members going into year two. And I was able to just jump right in with our first meeting in October. And right now we have nine staff members at Conservation Nation, but we have 25 Youth Advisory Council students from 13 different states. Um, and we meet over Zoom once a month. But our mission at Conservation Nation is to cultivate a more inclusive wildlife conservation movement. And we do that through education, career development, and grant making. So our education work right now is focused on showing students in middle school that, you know, that door exists to having a career in wildlife conservation. We want all students to see themselves represented in conservation careers and to be able to say, you know, I can see myself doing that if I want to. And then through the different types of funding we offer, like uh, grants, scholarships, fellowships, internships, we help open that door for young people in accessing careers in conservation and then supporting them with career growth and networking. So in building a mission like this from the ground up, it has been really important for us to have input from youth advisors who are kind of somewhere in between that middle school age audience for our education program and then the young professionals really you know wanting to and actually pursuing conservation careers so our youth advisors have been able to do things like um, actually review and comment on our programming uh, coordinate uh, speaker panels featuring our grantees uh, they've designed content for our website and social media. And I think as we move forward as an organization, I believe they're going to play a really important role as actual ambassadors um, for a team leaders and conservation program that they're helping me design. Um, and one story I wanted to share is an example of how helpful their input has been in the creation of the education program because when I started at Conservation Nation, one of the first things I wanted to do was to focus on building the middle school curriculum that had been piloted uh, the year before. So I invited our curriculum writer who was already working on some lessons about conservation careers with me. And I asked her to test out some of her early drafts with the Youth Advisory Council. So obviously we had to make some modifications to make it work over Zoom, but it did work and it was so, so helpful because the information in the lessons for middle school was new and interesting to these students. So they were learning a lot, but they could also be really honest about what worked and didn't work um, just with the way the material was presented. And the writer left that meeting totally energized and inspired. And we all felt that was a really positive and helpful experience. Great, thanks so much, Diane, for sharing and for sharing that story as well. Um, we'll pass the mic over to Kirsten. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me in the space today. Um, I'm Kirsten Johansson. I use she, her pronouns. And for the last six years, I've been working with the city of Austin, the Parks and Rec Department in a variety of different programs who have changed names and evolved over the years. But really the work that I've been doing um, is focused on youth, green workforce development that centers race equity and works on organizational culture change. Um, and I do that majority of my job through the hat of Austin Civilian Conservation Corps currently, which is intricately designed and, and tied with the cities connecting children to nature youth leadership working group that Ashley and I and Sheridan and Alondra are chair members of um, so I think working with Ashley Sheridan and the other young folks that have been involved with ACCC as 
I'm going to say that that's a shortened one for Austin Sterling Conservation Coriel. It's too much of a mouthful. Um, and our other partners who have the same mission uh, has been an incredible joy in my life. So just the personal impact is certainly there for me and keeps me going. Um, as a bit older of a person now, not considered youth, I find working with youth groups, councils, or working groups um, have had such an impact on me personally and the program I oversee. Really personally, working with young folks help me helps me sustain in a, a world that has so many challenges. And I can just see the energy and excitement and hope um, with the folks that I work with. Um, so they keep me going and we work together to support each other. Uh, and then the program I oversee is uh, our young folks are, they go through the program and they're hired on to be the leaders of the next generation of the program and they're in leadership positions. Uh, so we work really hard to make sure that our program models youth adult partnerships and in fact they're the de decision making folks for their different pathways and, and projects um so that that kind of quote of nothing about us uh should be without us so really bringing in young folks to design the program that's for them has been a game changer um and then for me working with youth councils and other things it's really pushed the courage, braveness to work on culture change, um, particularly with nature focused groups in Austin and has inspired a call to action to very much center race equity. And city of Austin defines equity as um, when race is no longer the predictor of life outcomes. And we see that we need to do that centering in youth work or any work in Austin. Um, so with the last, 12 years or so, and then definitely with Ashley in our last year, um, we've been trying to do that. And I'll just speak as, as a white person, um, there's such a role for me to support in trying to dismantle the racist system and advocating for environmental sustainability. This is about life and death work and white organizational culture and racism cause harm to all of us. So, um, it's about real culture change and shifting away from white organizational culture. And we in youth leadership try to model that. And we try to hold ourselves accountable to, to really do the hard work and have honest conversations and be uncomfortable together. And we do that with our young folks. Like Ashley said, changing the power dynamics. We talk about race as a power dynamic. We talk about age as a power dynamic and how that impacts how we show up with each other. And um, we really are trying to shift towards a culture of care. It might sound a little hokey, but that is um, a relational culture. You've heard it other ways as well. Um, and then it's also about changing structures, policy, and barriers to employment that have been created intentionally to exclude and oppress folks of color. So we work to where in our smaller spheres, where can we have control that shift and change? So we have. Um, more young folks of color that uh, in our jobs that have been in traditionally white dominated spaces. So my hope today is that you kind of hear some of the things Ashley and our, and, and our other panelists share. And then um, if it doesn't come up in all the, the things we share, really think in your groups when you work with young folks of how do we center race equity in our youth councils. Um, so yeah, and I think the last thing I always like to think about is race equity work and youth leadership work is about relations. So this the change happens at the speed of a relationship. So that can be slow, but um, that's also where I've had the deepest, most wonderful relationships in my life. So thanks for having me here. Thank you, Kirsten, for sharing and also reminding us how equity and relationship building um, can very much be at the forefront of all of our work, especially when we work with young people. I'm going to pass the mic over to Tyler um, to introduce um, himself and um, talk about your experience with youth advisory councils. Thank you, folks. Thank you, folks. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here in this space. Um, so yes, my name is Tyler. Um, my pronouns are he, they. Um, I've been an organizer and an activist in the broader ecological movement for about a decade now. And I'm 23, so I've been doing this from a 
really young age, but more pertinently, um, I'm the Speakers Bureau Director, or at least the new Speakers Bureau Director for Earth Guardians, and I've been a part of the EG um, Youth Council for the past two years now. Um, on the side, I'm more of a farmer, so I work with a pretty large group of Black and Indigenous farmers um, in the DMV area, just ensuring that we as a collective have access um, to the traditional heirloom seeds that we have a right to have access to. Um, but in regards to youth advisory councils um, and their impacts, and specifically in the context of EG Earth Guardians, um, the organization that I'm speaking you know, on behalf of today, um, I think those impacts are vast. Um, I think it's also important to note that a youth council is in fact the lead youth decision-making body in our organization that's set in stone. That's our policy really honing in on its significance. Um, our council also recently made a transition to become international from national. So now encompassing a global perspective on the work we do um, and who we are as youth. Um, our organization has also evolved over the past you know, couple of years extensively, um, and so has our youth council over the past few years. Um, so without a youth council, EG would not, would not be as impactful as it is today. So for example, um, our youth council here at EG was behind one of our largest campaigns um, really ever <laughs> last year, um, which was our Choose Action Now campaign, CAN. Um, and the intention behind this was to really mobilize youth and the public to respond to what we had deemed, you know, as a collective of, you know, very aware and caring youth um, as a failure of multilateral climate negotiations at COP27 in Egypt, which just recently passed um, towards the end of last year. Um, so every member on the council, when I say every, I mean every member on the council was so dedicated, put in so much time and energy to bring this vision that we had earlier on in the year um, and really bringing that to fruition. So as a result, uh, we hosted a network of actions in 22 countries, uh, 51 cities and 75 um, actions worldwide. So I personally had the honor of organizing and co-leading our Washington DC rally in March um, back in November as a youth council member as well. Um, so hopefully I get to bring that perspective um, of actually serving on the council uh, to these conversations. Um, additionally, um, our youth council plugs into and supports most of our working groups and programs that run under the Earth Guardians umbrella. Um, so our youth council is quite literally the backbone of our organization, um, but thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Tyler. And thanks for reminding us of how organizations can often be built from youth councils too. So it goes both ways, right? Um, for our next question to the panel, uh, we'd love to hear what are some lessons you learned along the way in your youth advisory council and thinking about, um, you know, just the fact that we don't always get things right on the first time. So we really wanna hear, you know, some of those lessons learned and those opportunities for growth that maybe even young people pointed you to. Uh, so we'll just follow the same order maybe that we started with the first time. So we'll kick off with Ashley. All right. Um, let's see, lessons learned along the way. Yeah, you know, every life is a journey. Work is a journey, it's an experience. So definitely taking lessons learned along the way. Um, in our, you know, in our youth leadership working group, um, you know, we like to emphasize, you know, we, we, we use this group to imagine an Austin and like which young folks, young people can easily access careers in the outdoors and nature and the environment, but particularly also being fairly compensated for their contributions in that field um, and providing these leadership opportunities and roles. Um, and, you know, developing this working group and developing these lessons or these opportunities, um, you know, it really takes a lot of listening, you know, um, a lot of listening to our youth, uh, you know, things that you might have not perceived um, in, in our, you know, adult life. Um, I always quote adult, I'm like, I'm an adult. I don't know why I always quote it. <laughs> 
Um, but listening to our youth needs, right, in terms of scheduling and, and flexibility, in terms of transportation, you know, transportation is such uh, an, a heavy thing that people tend to forget about. Um, food, right, access to food, access to transportation, um, you know, opening up the barriers to make the experience um, more livable and, and, you know, reducing these actual barriers so they can come and, and speak to the fullest, speak their voice to the fullest. Um, I think it's really important just to be that listening to figure out your, your, your audience and figure out what they actually need. Um, so, yeah, that was my, probably one of my most important lessons, um, you know, not knowing not being that person to be like, oh, well, this is what you need and this is what you need to know. Um, and this is what I can give to you. Um, but really shifting that dynamic and that power dynamic and making uh, the youth voice the priority. Um, yeah, I think that would probably be one of like the most important lessons I've learned uh, in my journal. Great, thanks, Ashley. I think active listening is something that we are all continuously learning in our journeys, both in our personal lives and of course with the young people that we have the pleasure of working with. Um, and I think part of that, you know, ties back to that conversation around equity, right? Um, alrighty, so we'll pass the mic over to Diane. Thanks. Yes, some of the lessons that I have learned, um, I think it's important to treat the youth advisors like professionals and show them how valued they are um, and put them to work, but also play a lot of games and make it fun. So there's some of my group, um, like I said, we we meet over Zoom, so that can be a little bit challenging. And I I think going forward for me, I would rather have a smaller group and meet more often. Um, but I've still been able to get a lot of great feedback from these students. And I found that sometimes the best feedback that I get from them actually comes from surveys. Um, and I think that's partly because we meet over Zoom, so it can feel intimidating to speak out in that context, especially when you don't really know the other students well. Um, so sometimes I give them time, like during our meetings, to actually go fill out Google Forms that I've created to get feedback on various different aspects of, uh, of our work. And I found that to be extremely valuable, um, just a great way to get feedback that I may not be getting through the discussions that we're having. Um, and I really value that. And then when we do have discussions, I usually break them into smaller groups, um, just with breakout rooms over Zoom, because as I said, it's a large group. And I think the most um, valuable and comfortable conversations happen when there's only three to four students. Um, but I do ask for feedback from the youth advisors after every meeting that we have. And I consistently hear um, their favorite things are working in the small groups in the breakout rooms, playing the warm up games and doing the trivia questions. Um, so just, you know, the fun stuff. And then also they really value hearing about the work we're doing from people within the organization. So I think, again, that goes back to treating them like professionals, giving them the opportunity to interact with the other staff members and be able to, you know, express their ideas directly to the CEO and the director of philanthropy and the director of the grants program um, so that they really feel like they're a valued part of the team. I hope that's helpful. I think so. <laughs> Um, thanks, Diane, for sharing. And it's great to hear that you all are meeting the young people where they're at. So hearing that they, you know, prefer breakout groups and creating that space at each meeting. I know personally um, helps even for adults um, to have a smaller space to connect. So yeah, thanks for that. Um, we'll pass it over to Kirsten. Yeah, so many lessons learned. Um, <laughs> And I think the first lesson I'll share is um, within equity work and working with young folks, 
being self-reflective and showing up to our spaces, having done our own work. Um, I've been very much learning from Mindful of Race by Ruth King and also um, Dr. Sean Ginwright's book called The Four Pivots recently. There's so many resources, resources out there, but those two have been really impactful as of late. Um, and Dr. Ginwright's is uh, shifting from lens at which we look in the world to mirror. So really looking back at ourselves and seeing how we are, um, who we, how we show up in spaces based on our complex identities and how we hold power in those different identities and how we can change ourselves to change culture because really the change does start with us as individuals. Um, so again, as a, a white person doing this work, I've very much um, had to commit to the and chosen to be brave, to be on the imperfect journey. Like Ashley mentioned, it's the journey and it's challenging um, and doing the daily work to really think through these things. So lesson learned is carve, carve out paid time to be reflective in our very busy, busy days so that um, we push back against the sense of urgency and can very much center ourselves to, to make, make real change. Um, and we try to do that with our young folks too, because we get caught up in the things and feel, feel stressed, but how can we pause and be more reflective? Um, another thing is learning to have some healing spaces. Um, Ashley and Sheridan are creating some really wonderful events for our group this year of like having young folks and adults make tree cookies and go tree climbing as we're also developing and building our relationships together and finding joy. We'll probably talk about anti-racism and normalize that too, but how can we blend still having joy for this work? Adrienne Marie Brown, a huge shout out to pleasure activism there, which reminds us to find the joy even when we're doing tough work. Um, and I might throw it back to Ashley or maybe circle back of the meandering pathways. That has been one of our biggest lessons learned, um, but I know she can share so much more about that. Yeah, I'll just pop in and quickly speak about our meandering pathways and and building, building the network. Um, one of the most exciting things about um, holding these spaces for our youth, our youth advisory council is providing these opportunities um, between all of our networks. And Kirsten and I work for the city, but we work for two totally different departments. Um, and through our work, we get to engage in different departments and different nonprofits. So when we do, um, you know, have our youth, you know, they might start let's say they'll start here at Urban Forestry Youth Forest Council, but then they have the opportunity to then grow and expand their leadership opportunities, um, maybe moving over to ACCC with Kirsten or moving over to a nonprofit field with Austin Youth Riverwatch. Um, so by creating these partnerships and um, having these, these these spaces where all of our youth le youth leaders can come together and speak about their experience, speak about their speaking about not only the good stuff but also the bad stuff, right? And also, um, you know, hearing from other youth voices about different experiences in their job roles and their titles and um, their everyday outings. But our meandering pathways idea is just such a great cooperative idea because it essentially we can continue the movement, right? It's not stifled. We can continue to build and we can continue to push our young, to to encourage our young leaders to, to um, learn different types of, um, different types of careers or different types of um, green career opportunities, um, whether it's in the city, whether it's nonprofit or whether it's their own personal experience. Um, yeah, so essentially like creating those pathways have, has been a very exciting part of our work um, and seeing that advancement with our youth. Um, and, you know, I was just thinking about Yuriel and his, you know, starting from, starting as a cadet and now one of our youth leaders is, you know, full-time employee uh, for city of Austin and part department. So just seeing that experience and, and, seeing that that pathway that it worked essentially and um our youth leaders can go on to you know amazing things
Great. Thank you both. And it sounds like collaboration is a big part in making that happen. Um, so that's awesome to hear. And I'm, I think a lot of people in this room will probably think back to all the spaces that they've had collaboration and how successful it is when you're working together versus being siloed. All righty, Tyler, do you want to share with us next? Of course, thank you. Um, I guess one of the biggest lessons um, that I've learned, and this really just echoes to what Kirsten and Ashley um, were just touching on, some of the other narratives and notions that have been brought up in this conversation, um, is just the significance of rest um, as that directly correlates to healing. I, I feel like we're naturally in a space um, in an environment that's constantly working to mitigate and amplify some of the world's most existential challenges. That is not easy work, <laughs> especially for a young person. So learning to ground and center ourselves, really leaning into a balance of fun or rest and work um, helped in terms of generating you know, consistency within the youth council um, and also dually allowed us to show up fully as our true authentic selves. Um, I think there's also undeniably, inarguably, a spiritual element that cannot be ignored here. Um, that is directly tied to the fierce passion that's embedded within us all. Um, and, you know, so with that, I ask, isn't that worth preserving and seeing to continuity? Um, and I mean, if you looked at that picture <laughs> that was just brought up <laughs> and subsequently taken down, um, that was a few youth council folks um, and speakers bureau members in New Mexico. Now, I think that was probably one of the best examples of a time we unified in a state of rest um, and healing um, and really got together and just learned about one another in a way that you know isn't necessarily professional or revolves around the work that we're doing. Um, so as a result, I, I'm pretty confident that I can you know call my fellow professionals, yes, but my friends, my family, um, you know, uh, within this youth council. And I think another lesson that kind of ties to that directly um, is that we are literally our own community and family. We are our own support networks. You know, we're not isolated individuals. Yes, sometimes we may have a meeting in Zoom, um, but the connection and the relation is so much deeper than that. Um, just, I think we should reflect on this, just as there are, you know, ebbs and flows to life, um, the same notion can be applied to a youth council. Once again, we are human beings. <laughs> we are young people attempting to relate to one another um, in a much broader context. And that context obviously is our planet. It's our environment and it's the people that inhabit it. Um, so actually making the effort to get to know one another through vulnerable means. And it's so difficult sometimes to be vulnerable, you know, in the conditions that have been established, say by COVID or some of the other challenges that we're dealing with. Um, has certainly made EG's Youth Council all the better and our work 10 times, 100 times more impactful. And once again, this is all easier said than done. So, I mean, it really does take, you know, following, you know, by example, inspiration um, and deep, very, very deep listening um, and care and compassion um, to pave that pathway forward. From all four of you, I'm hearing themes of reflection, rest, and joy, and I dropped those in the chat to be of inspiration as we move into our Q&A. Um, but before we go there, um, any last bit of advice? Some of y'all already kind of touched on this um, in terms of finding space for reflection and joy, but anything else the four of you think of? Um, as advice to give to organizations who are either starting their youth councils or maybe in a pause period where they're realizing maybe things aren't working and they need a pivot. I think jumping on what Tyler was just saying about, um, you know, we're all sharing this planet. And uh, I have actually really valued working with students in the past and previous roles um, who weren't really like environmental science focused students. Um, because I think ways that you can get involved with an organization, you know, on a youth advisory council, you know, it, it may not require any experience or like hyper focused interest in the exact mission of your work. For example, 
you might want to have some youth advisors who are really tech savvy and like know how to reach young people through social media and they just are there because they're curious and want to learn more about the mission but um they bring you know a totally different background and personality to the youth advisory council um you might want to have some future teachers who just love working with kids or who love theater but maybe they're not super comfortable talking about science, uh, climate change, whatever, but they want to grow in that area. So I think in general, just um, the more diverse personalities and backgrounds that you have on your youth advisory council, the more interesting the whole experience will be for everybody. Thank you, Diane. Um, to give enough time for the Q&A, we're going to move on to that piece of our session today. Um, so for the next 15 or so minutes, we'll go into our Q&A, and this is an informal opportunity for you all to ask questions um, to the speakers. So if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to drop it in the chat, um, or if you're feeling brave, you can go ahead and raise your hand, um, and we'll call upon you to ask your question out loud. We do uh, want to remind folks that this time is pretty short, um, so please be mindful of sharing the space with your peers, and so we ask that folks limit their engagement to one question at a time. All right, we'll go ahead and start with Janelle, who's raised their hand. Hi, um, my camera's not working, but uh, Janelle Ross, she, her, I uh, work for the Catamount Institute in Colorado Springs, and we've either worked with organizations or attempted our, ourselves to have a youth advisory council, but we've always struggled to actually get teens or youth in the door and then to stay. Um, if you could talk a bit about um, how you um, we're able to get a larger group of kids and then how you were able to retain them as well. I can quickly um, speak on this um, about retaining youth. Um, I found it very helpful um, when recruiting or, or trying to find youth to bring in is to have a youth representative as well. Um, you know, having someone that looks similar to the folks that you are trying to bring into your group. Um, it's very helpful, you know, because you can go into these spaces and you can say, well, this is a wonderful opportunity and you should join. Um, but it's better to get a perspective from, from someone their the similar their similar age. Um, mm -hmm. Food is always helpful, you know. <laughs> food is A1, and maybe a, a, a slight compensation for coming to the space and providing their voice. Um, in our youth leadership working group, we actually uh, provide gift cards, music gift cards for our youth participants who are not currently in an in internship. Um, you know, talking about collaborations again, we have a lot of great partners that also bring up the youth into our spaces and they pay their youth to be in our space as well. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just, it's it's great to have that that collaboration, but then we have youth that are not a part of any kind of group or internship or anything where we can um, provide some sort of compensation um, for their time to show that it's extremely important and their voices and their voice and their contributions are valued. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. I think another thing, like um, I'm hitting this one hard, but there's the theme for me, um, self-reflection and culture change. If your organization is mimicking and perpetuating, like all of our organizations have been part of uh, white organizational culture, that is not a space that folks of color particularly and young folks wanna be in. So change ourselves and our work groups, and that is going to help us retain young folks. Um, of course, the other things that our panelists have been saying too. And it's all at the same time. So we know culture change is a hard thing, but being transparent that you want to do it and you're trying is going to be better than, than not sharing that, even if we're messing up as we're doing it.
Thank you both. Uh, we've got a few different questions in the chat. So we've got Austin um, Bowley, apologies if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, asking what kind of games do you play in a virtual space with youth advisory councils? Do you have a recommended list somewhere? So I think that's mostly a question for Diane. That is such a good question. And I wish I had a list that I could just put in the chat and share with you. Um, but a lot of the game ideas came from um, a group that I was, it was a youth group I was running in partnership with the Montgomery County Department of Environmental Protection. And the students would um, work with us all year to learn about energy conservation. And then their capstone project at the end was that they went out into all the public libraries to teach kids about um, energy conservation. So that we did something that um, Kirsten, you touched on earlier, which was hire one of the students from that group. They all got SSL student service learning hours to be the leader and the coordinator for the group going forward. And she came up with all these games. But just to give you one example of how simple it can be, um, the game that we played for our first meeting was you share something about yourself and if others have that in common keep your cameras on and if you don't you turn your cameras off so for example if i were to say summer is my favorite season if summer is your favorite season you keep your cameras on otherwise you turn it off that's a game that just it has a lot of movement it's fun you start to see like oh i've got things in common with these other people um but you know i've i've been thinking i need to like get that list from Caroline and put it out there. So if I do, I will definitely let you know. And honestly, asking the students for what games they like to play, because we all had years of, you know, doing that. So in different classes and different groups they were involved in, that was really how we got um, all of our ideas for games that they would like. This kind of leads to the next question um, from Oscar. How do you create and who is involved in the creation of meeting agendas for youth councils? I realize how much power there is in an in agenda setting, but also want to ensure structure. I can tie on in that if that's all right. <laughs> um, so basically at Earth Guardians, I mean, what we've tried to make an effort to do is one, um, elect a youth director to help with the administrative um, side of things. And yes, you guessed it, the youth director is, you know, a youth or youth council member, um, technically speaking. Um, and another alternative that we have also dabbled with is actually having the council, you know, in its own right, establish the next, uh, next meeting's agenda um, at the meeting beforehand. So they're actually setting their own agenda. And I 100% agree with you, agendas provide the structure um, and the consistency that is needed um, to keep that youth council running. So, I mean, please, it's so important that there isn't some top bottom approach to organizing youth councils that you're actually having the youth participate and lead um, in their own right in terms of doing the work. Um, in organizing and you know formulating the structure of youth council that they are actively participating in. So I mean it's nice to have that you know level of compartmentalization. Um, but also another quick note on that note <laughs> is really just the significance of intergenerational connections, right? So young people can't do these things alone. Um, and the adults who are also leading in this organization can't either. There is in fact, a beneficial and very beautiful inextricable relationship between the two groups. So let that play out. And I promise you that beautiful things will come to fruition. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, all right, let's see what else we've got. Um, I think some of you already answered this in the chat, but all are all of the groups that you work with panelists compensated for their time? And if maybe um, you haven't always compensated them, how did you get there?
Well, I can jump in on this one. Um, Ashley and I have worked with partners and, and young folks to think through a variety of ways to compensate people. Um, we work for different entities, both Ashley and I are for the city of Austin. So paying people through employment, if they're employees, is simple. Giving out Visa gift cards and giving nonprofits money is harder. So uh, what we've done across partners is like, how do you pay people? What's the easiest, lowest hanging fruit? And then we share. And sometimes we call it, it's a double dip where someone works for Austin Youth River Watch, but through this one variety, we can get them some more hours. So we just kind of support each other in making sure if a young person is in the space that we're gonna compensate them for their time. And it's just about communicating with the partners, making sure they're on board. And then young folks know to also tell us like, hey, I did show up, but I'm not sure how I'm gonna get compensated. And then we, as the organization leaders kind of like, how do we do this best? Um, with the city, there's a lot of bureaucracy. So we try to rely on our partners too. And we've gotten grants and learning lesson learned. If we get a grant again, we'll probably host it with a nonprofit partner so that they can give the money out um, because it's very hard to do so in the city. So really we just try a whole bunch of different strategies, but com clear communication together to make it work. Great, thanks, Kirsten. Um, let's see. Uh, the definition of youth is pretty broad. What are the span of ages that you all have had um, participation with on your councils? This is like a million dollar question in the Children and Nature Network space. So I smile a bit when I see this because we um, at the Children and Nature Network change it. Um, depending on who we're serving. So typically at the Children and Nature Network, when we say youth in this space, we say um, 15 to 28. What yeah. about you all? In our youth leadership working group space, we define youth ages 14 to 24. I can go next. Um, this has actually been a source of quite a few conversations, rather contentious conversations um, over the past few years. I mean, obviously this is central to our work, um, but what we've tried to do is align very closely um, with the United Nations definition of youth, which I believe is around 14 or 15 to 24. Um, and I mean, there's obviously leniency in that because I mean, within the context of UG, we have youth as young as, I mean, 12, 10, 9, all over the world, you know, uh, participating in our crew network. So it gets really difficult. Um, but I imagine that this is going to be a rolling conversation, even if you're trying to start a uh, youth council for the first time as well. I think ours is very similar, um, but we kind of just say high school and college. Um, but I've been getting feedback from some of the college students who um, the college students, they're freshmen right now, so they are students who had been on the advisory council as high school students and just really, really wanted to stay on it this year. And I've been getting some feedback that they would like to take on a more of a leadership role. Um, so I really like that idea of maybe finding a way to hire them as interns or coordinators. Um, but that's generally the same age group, I think, that we're focused on. Great, thank you. And we have one last question, unless more come through. Um, how do you invite youth to lead in this space? What roles might they take on? One of the roles that we are working on right now is um, having the Youth Advisory Council host a couple of speaker panels with featuring um, the young conservationists that we're supporting through grants. So that has been a way for them to, um, I think, feel really part of the team 
and and get to know the work we're doing really well and we will be doing our first one in march so wish us luck but i think at this point like all of these young people are very very comfortable in you know running a zoom webinar and participating in that way so we're really excited about that i think quickly just another way to invite youth to be a leader in this space is to have their colleagues essentially um, reach out to them and their youth colleagues and talk about um, the possibilities and opportunities and and the encouragement um to speak in these spaces and you know like tyler was saying you know we are we are friends you know we are we are building these communities and in these friendships um and when you're in these spaces where you feel comfortable um at being asked to lead um a, a talk or a demonstration is is more familiar because you are amongst folks that you know and and amongst folks that will encourage you. One really quick strategy that young folks shared with us that works well is if you ask young folks to facilitate and lead something, provide them the paid time and support to prepare for that. Um, we do a 30 minute or an hour before our youth leadership working group meetings uh, for young folks to work through things and practice um, because that just like, allows them to feel more comfortable and then confident when they go into a space with a lot of adults or whoever. And lastly, um, I mean, I would add pretty simply is just to make sure that you're actually curating the platforms and the resources for young people to not only succeed, right, but to also lead um, in the context of that question. I mean, I highly doubt, I mean, if you're sending out an invite that, you know, a young person, I mean, I guess you should say that it's really important that you're first curating a group of young people that you know are actually displaying and conveying the need, the want, the desire to actually take on leadership roles before you even consider doing anything else. Um, because I mean, right, it would be a waste of time to impose, you know, leadership roles on people who, or young people who don't necessarily wish to take up those responsibilities. And that's a whole other conversation for another time. Um, but to the second part of your question, I mean, once again, really having them plug into all aspects of your organization, young people are capable, you know, they're very capable. I think they've demonstrated that already. So they can do the work, they can handle the work, and they can succeed with that work. Um, so, I mean, simply facilitate and curate that environment for, for that success to come to fruition. Uh, do not doubt it. <laughs> because, I, like I said, like I said earlier, I mean, I 100% firmly believe that beautiful things will come. Of formulating youth councils and also just amplifying the voices of young people. Earth Guardians have done it. You know, the panelists in this conversation have just told y'all <laughs> they have already done it. Um, so please take that first step, you know, imbue yourself with the courage that's necessary to move forward on this, you know, pathway of collective planetary healing and go, just go, do not look back. Yeah, and on that note, I'll just add, you know, thinking about what mentorship looks like for young leaders to step into leadership roles, just knowing that every young person isn't going to have it all together, right? Just like we don't as adults. Um, and uh, if you're not able to provide that mentorship, finding someone else in your partnerships or your collaboratives or even at your organization who can support um, the young people as they grow their own leadership skills. Um, well, we only have two minutes left together. Um, and before we wrap up our time together, um, I just want to share my deep gratitude to Ashley, Diane, Kirsten, and Tyler for your time and for sharing your stories with us today. Um, and to the Children in Nature Network team who helped support and put this event together. And a big, big thank you to all of you who attended the workshop. We know that time is one of our most valuable assets and we really thank you for sharing yours with us today. Um, as a reminder, we will continue to do these Inside Out series on youth leadership development on a bi-monthly basis for the rest of the year. Um, and a recording will be sent out to all registered members in about a week. 
Um, and if you know any colleagues who weren't able to sign up before it sold out, um, it will also be made available on our website. Thank you, everyone.